Verse 17 of 1 Timothy chapter 1. Miss Rhonda found the sheet music for it today. The words are straight from the Bible. 1 Timothy 1 17 is, is what we're going to sing right now. I know some people may not know it. It's called Now Unto the King Eternal is the name of the song. But let's we'll follow along in the Bible. It's 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. I'll give everyone a moment to get there. I need to get there as well. I do know it, but well, uh, here we go. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.17 as we start tonight. We're going to sing it through a few times. If you've never heard it before, we'll sing it about three times. Maybe by the third time we'll get it. We'll, we'll probably sing this one again in a couple weeks. And we're going to do some more of these Bible songs and some other songs that aren't in the hymn book. Miss Rhonda has a whole notebook of some really good songs there that we're going to start singing on Sunday nights. So uh, I don't have the words on the screen, but open your Bibles and let's start. First Timothy 1 Timothy 1.17. Let's sing now unto the King Eternal. Yeah. 
this for there. It's taking a trip that leads to heaven. You don't try heaven. It's not something you try. I don't like when people say, try Jesus, right? No, no. It's a trip that leads to heaven. I can't wait till we take that trip. Hopefully in the rapture, right? But happiness is the Lord. Let's go ahead and sing Little is Much next. Little is Much when God is in it. Hit number 219.
testimony time now, and a prayer request as well. I'm going to keep the prayer list updated every week, so the, the new prayer list will always come out on Wednesday night. We'll hand it out Wednesday night. Keep those with you throughout the week, and definitely pray for everyone. There's going to be other ways to give prayer requests as well. You can text me or Miss Hannah, and also leave a prayer request in one of the two boxes that we have as well. I'll be checking them after every service. So those are ways to give prayer requests throughout the week, so we can keep everything updated. But Let's go ahead and take some prayer requests and testimonies at this time. Ms. Grace, I saw you first. Yeah, um, praise the Lord for the absolutely beautiful weather, even yeah. today. The cooler weather has helped me to feel so much better. Oh, good. Yes. Um, I want to praise the Lord that I am still pregnant. <laughs> still keep going. It's a good thing. Um, good. Yes, it's very exciting. I still cannot believe we're going to have another baby. Yes. I mean, it's wonderful, but my mind is still blown about that. Mm -hmm. And, um, okay, I think that's it. That's perfect. Yeah. Um, oh, prayer request. Uh, yes. His name is Will. Yeah, I can't He's remember. I'm no, sorry, I can't remember what I've heard. Oh, no, I know. For um, we would just start being. I'm still struggling with food, so mm -hmm. just pray that the Lord works it out. I don't want to get into details. It's long, but I'm just still struggling yeah. with food. So. So that you'll get on a good diet. It'll, yes. Yeah. It's healthy for you and the baby. Yes. I'm, yes. Yeah. That has been a struggle. Yes. Thank you. All right. No. No. Yeah. I always have no problem. Oh, one more yes. pray. Go ahead. Um, Will did phenomenal last month. Thank you to everyone who oh, was yeah. praying. Uh, he just did so great, which is amazing because, you know, winter, inflation, new baby on the way, it's yeah. God's timing. So I'm praise the Lord because we'll, like, hit it out of the park, okay. and I'm very excited about that. Oh, excellent, yes. All right, anybody else? Have this happen, yes.
time tonight. Good, good food. All right. And praise God for that. Excellent. Uh, praise his brother Eric. And, and definitely, uh, I like his prayer request to bring people in. We've been praying for that. And the Lord will do his work. Amen. I told somebody, the Lord gives, the Lord taketh away. I didn't say that. I praise the Lord. Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. No, he slain me. Yes, yeah, the way he slain me. Job said a lot of uh, a lot of wise things there. And, and, and all that, what did it say? All this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Amen. Right. So when we go through those valleys that Brother Eric talked about, that's a great attitude to have through that. And um, it's just a wonderful thing. I'll give one more opportunity if anyone else wants to give anything tonight. If not, we'll get right into the lesson. I don't even know if we're going to finish the lesson tonight because there's so much in this particular lesson. We've, we're already on week three. And, uh, we're not even close to being at the end, but um, I am going to skip over some of the illustrations they gave. They gave a lot. It's kind of a, you know, they you could tell the writer of the book was very passionate about this specific topic, and there's a lot of illustrations. I'm not going to give them all tonight, so we may finish if I do skip a few of them, but I'm, I'm going to give a couple because they do fit well. But I do want to give one more opportunity if someone else has another anything else to share. If not, we'll get right into it. Ms. Adam, yes. Death, 
right? So death came into the world. It says death by sin. So sin, death passed upon all men for all have sinned. The damage is great. The value, though, is protected. The value of the human life is still protected. The sin that came into the world doesn't change the value of human life. God still places a great value on human life, even though we don't. And we ought to, obviously, but oftentimes we don't. And I'm not saying we as in individually here. I'm talking about just human mankind in general. And it's become trendy to not place value on human life. And it's a sad thing to see. But we're going to talk tonight. That's been going on a long, long time. A lot longer. It's not a new, this is not a new topic. This has been going on for a long time. But the value of human life is protected. We talk about how, in fact, this is where we're going to pick up tonight. We ended with this last week. We'll pick up here tonight. It says, the sixth, so number six of the Ten Commandments specifically prohibits murder. It specifically prohibits murder. Now, somebody asked me afterwards about, you know, uh, if you're in the army or, the, you know, if you're out in war and you kill, obviously, God killed people. So, um, you know, he's had, he had to, right? God's judgment upon sin. God's killed many people and he will throughout the tribulation as well. And so, it's not, when it says, thou shalt not kill, it's obviously talking about murder. Right? Um, the, but, Thou shalt not kill is important. It's one of the Ten Commandments that prohibits murder. Genesis chapter 9, verse 6 says this, Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Do you see how because God made man in his own image, the, the importance and the sanctity that he puts on life, the sacredness that we talked about last week, he, we're made in his image. We ought not to go around just killing people for no reason. It happens way too much. Every year in Philly and other major cities throughout the country, and really in the world, it's a problem too. But the murder rate keeps going up and up and up. It's a sad thing. There's many people shedding innocent blood. Many people shedding innocent blood. Notice in the verse above, the Genesis 9 6, notice that even after the fall, God still, after this is after Adam and Eve sinned, right? God still said that man was created in his image. God still put a special value on human life, even after the fall. So the fall of man and sin does not change the fact that God still views us as valuable and sacred. And it's a wonderful truth, it really is. Somewhat of what we can talk about what we talked about this morning, in a way, there's, there's no one, God doesn't look at anyone and say, I, I can't save them, or I can't, you know. Now some people continue in their unbelief, and some people continue in that. But, but I will say this, I don't know everybody's, I know some people's history in here, I don't know everything that's happened in your life, you may have known somebody or been really close with somebody who has maybe had an abortion or, or done something like that or maybe in the past, um, but let me tell you, we're speaking the truth in love, that's what we talked about last week, God will forgive that, God can and will and wants to forgive. There's nothing God can't forgive. We need to understand that. That's really what we talked about this morning, where Paul was saying, I'm the chiefest of sinners. And God forgave me. God gave him a new life, a new purpose, a new cause. And nobody, everyone's without excuse. Nobody can say, I'm so wicked. I've done this and that. God can never forgive me. No one can say that. No one can say that. Whoso shed a man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God may he man. And this is under letter B, the value is protected. Here's a sad thing. I'm going to read this about a certain article that was in a magazine called Salon Magazine. There was a lady named, they interviewed a lady named Mary Elizabeth. I don't know if I have this slide. I don't have this slide yet. So there's a lady named Mary Elizabeth Williams. Her name's Mary Elizabeth Williams. She wrote a jarring piece in Salon Magazine, and it was titled this. This is sad. So what if? Abortion ends life. And that's a, she's saying that sarcastically. So what if abortion ends life? In the article, Williams presents what used to be a pro-life argument that the baby in the womb has personhood. She actually believes that the baby, this lady's really confused. And this is why it's important to stick with what the Word of God says and not follow political trends because of things like this. It's, what are we talking about? Avoiding confusion, right? That's a whole, that's a whole series we're doing, avoiding confusion. This lady's confused because she actually believes that the, that the baby is a person. She believes that. She said the baby in the womb has personhood. But she concludes that the baby's life is more expendable than the mother's life. And for that reason, should not be legally protected. And that's, we see some people that believe that today. 
She wrote, I believe that the life starts at conception, so she got that right, and it's never stopped me from being pro-choice. And listen to her reasoning on this. This is why it's so important to know what the Word of God says, to avoid confusion. I know that throughout my own pregnancies, I never wavered for a moment in the belief that I was carrying a human life inside of me. I believe that's what a fetus is, a human life. This is her quoting. And that doesn't make me one iota less solidly pro-choice. It's really confusing there. I have friends who have referred to their abortions in terms of scraping out a bunch of cells. That's really sad. And then a few years later were exalted over the pregnancies that they unhesitantly described in terms of the baby and, and this kid. So they, what, the, what she's saying is she had friends that earlier on, when they were younger, did have abortions. And later on, decided to have babies. And suddenly, while they're pregnant, they say, oh, the baby or the kid. You know, like, much like the Bible says. Remember, we went over last week how when John the Baptist was in the womb and, and, and it was called, in the Bible, he was called the babe, the babe leaped, right? And then when Jesus was born, he was also, he was called a babe. So there was no, there's no difference in the Bible between a baby in the womb and a baby outside the womb. They're both called babies. And she said her friends did that. They would, they would, uh, they would call, when they, back when they had abortions, they would call it a bunch of cells. But when they actually decided to carry through the pregnancy, they called it a baby suddenly. Do you see how confusing life can get if you don't follow the word of God? That's confusing. It really is. She goes on to say, I'm not going to read this whole thing here, but when we try to act, this is another thing she said, when we try to act like a pregnancy doesn't involve human life, we wind up drawing stupid somatic lines in the sand. First trimester abortion versus second trimester versus late term. She's saying this. Dancing around the issue, trying to decide. If there's a single magic moment when a fetus becomes a person, are you, and this says, are you human only when you're born? Only when you're viable outside the womb. So some of what she's saying sounds right, but then she mixes up all this other stuff. Are you less of a human life when you look like a tadpole than when you can suck on your thumb? If by some random fluke I learned today I was pregnant, you bet I'd have an abortion. That's what she said after all that. I'd have the world's greatest abortion. My conviction is that the fetus is indeed life, but it's a life worth sacrificing. That's, that was actually published in a magazine. How sad that is. I don't want to read too many more of those examples because I know they're kind of gruesome and it's hard to swallow and I'm really kind of just reading it. It's kind of making me uh, not happy here but I'm a little angry about that. But um, only because you guys know I, I could have been on the other side of things. But um, I definitely could. I was a, definitely a candidate for being aborted. But praise God I wasn't and got a better planet. But um, the danger in basing an entire belief, even a good belief, on science. They're talking about basing things just on science alone, not on the Word of God. There's a danger of it. Even if it's good belief, if you base it on science alone, think about, <laughs> oh, I don't want to get, like I said, I don't want to get political either, but think about just the last few years, how many times the science has changed. Science isn't supposed to change, right? But it does, and, or at least, at least their view of science, their, their version of science changes, but that's the problem with it, right? So we do need to base things on the Word of God. How do we get to a point in our society that we see life as expendable. That's what that lady said in the article. Life's ex the baby's life is expendable. Here's one of the ways how, in John chapter 3 says this, John 3, 19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And we certainly see that today. Men's deeds are evil. Men, men do love darkness rather than light now. It's been like that since the beginning, since, since the fall that we talked about last week. Men have always loved darkness rather than light. The human heart without Christ is depraved. That word depraved. And willing to make self-centered choices. That's a sad thing because they love darkness rather than light. This issue is a spiritual issue. The issue of the sanctity of life. It is a spiritual issue. It's a biblical issue. And this is where they say it's not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. But... It's, they even say, as Christians, we cannot rally around the pro-life cause because it fits the agenda of a particular political party or cause. Neither should Christians embrace a pro-choice agenda because it is part of the political ideology that they support. Christians must stand for life regardless of which way the political or cultural wind turns and blows, they say. This is a biblical issue and one we must hold with clarity because the Bible is clear on it. We studied Romans chapter 1 in, in, earlier in the series. We looked at Romans chapter 1. That was our main text um, way back a couple weeks ago. And, but here, here it is, Romans chapter 125. This is what 
This is what uh, people are doing to this day. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And worship and serve the creature more than the creator. Who is blessed forever. Amen. The creator is the one who is blessed forever. But we, we now worship ourselves. This was in the lesson about humanism, if you remember that. Uh, back, I think it was lesson one or two. But that's what's happening right now. We change the truth of God into a lie. We, when I say we, I just mean humans who are not, who don't know the Lord, really, or ones who are deceived and confused. The devaluing, the devaluing of life began after the fall. In fact, just one chapter, think about it, just one chapter after Adam and Eve sinned, what happened? We read about the first murder. We just read, thou shalt not kill, right? That's one of the Ten Commandments. The first murder happened just one chapter after the fall, after Genesis 3. In Genesis 4, it talks about it. And Cain talked with Abel, his brother. It came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and slew him. So life that God valued so greatly that he, he created Adam and Eve and, and then they had they multiplied as, as God told them to do. And they, had, they had sons, but their sons, Cain and Abel, their one son Cain, ended up killing his brother Abel. They, he killed his brother Abel. So why is there confusion today in areas where God's given so much clarity? What do you think causes the confusion? Here's a statistic. 22 percent of pregnancies end in abortion. The United States of America aborts approximately 1.3 million babies every year. That is as many abortions every year as the number of Americans who were killed in the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, the Korean War, Vietnam, the Persian Gulf War, Iraq and Af Afghanistan wars all combined. Think about that. And this isn't a made-up statistic. That's a that's a real deal right there. That's a real statistic. Except for the seven hundred thousand in the Civil War, it's yeah. more than all the other wars put together. Yeah, that's it's. Uh, isn't that sad? Because people they don't think it's murder. They don't call it murder. They they think that it's their right to do so and all that all those things. Romans chapter one, verses twenty nine. We're gonna read Romans one twenty nine and then Romans one thirty two after that. Being filled. With all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, and they look at, I don't have verse 32 on there, so I want to turn there, Romans 132. Once again, I'm going to have a, I'm going to have a meeting with the secretary this week about what he's doing here. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1, verse 32. I'm going to cut his pay. All right. Romans 132. Here we go. Romans 132 says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Think about that. There's people that know about the judgment of God, and they commit the same things that the people that are being judged commit. And not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. But I will say this, and the Bible says this, and there's only a pleasure in sin for a season. It's not lasting. It's not at all lasting. So I'm, not, I'm going to skip the next couple of illustrations. I might give one. Um, this one right here. This is about Governor. Or he's not, I don't think he's the governor anymore in New York, but he was when I was living up in New York for a little bit. Governor Cuomo. In uh, 2019, in January, he said this. He directed one of the spires of the World Trade Center to be lit up in pink in celebration of the Reproductive Health Act, a, a bill that expanded abortion rights and decriminalized the practice. Supporters were chanting, free abortion on demand, we can do it, yes we can. This kind of rally around death is reminiscent of the heathen acts of worship in the Old Testament as the Canaanites offered their children on the altars of the god Molech. Change the name of the god to convenience and the similarity becomes equivalence. That was a quote here from the book. But I, like I said, many more examples here. We're not going to get into all of them tonight or we'll never finish. We'll probably be on this lesson for another six, six weeks, but there's so much here. But one of the important takeaways regarding the fall of humanity is that just because something is common, this is, this is important to understand, even as Christians we need to understand this, just because something is common or something's accepted by the world, doesn't make it right, necessarily, no. Just because something is common and it happens one point whatever million times a year, doesn't make it right. So regardless of what any individual thinks or, or regardless of what a society accepts, the Bible is very clear. We've already, we're going to look at many more verses, obviously, because that's 
that's important to look at what the scripture says. But the Bible is very clear. Thou shalt not kill, right? That's pretty clear to me. So now we're going to talk about the response. This is point number three, the response to the issues of life. There are Christians who agree with what we have studied so far regarding the sanctity of life, right? You can't really argue with the Bible when it says thou shalt not kill. And you can't argue with saying that God created man in his own image. And that's mentioned more than once. And it's very clear that the, the, the description of the way God formed man was very, it was very obvious that he was giving special attention to man and women. But mankind, he, he gave special attention to Eve when he created Eve. Right? He made Eve a, a helpmate for Adam and gave her special attention as well. And there's, there's a sacredness to that. So we believe that, right? Um, and there's many kinds of injustices in the world today. There's, certain, there's other ones that we can talk about, and we'll get into some of them as the lessons go on. There's many other injustices in the world, but which have also, but this injustice was actually legalized. Um, it's been legalized in the United States since 1973. And now there's a debate about certain states are wanting to, um, wanting to still keep it legal, and then other states don't. And what about that? Yeah. Yeah, they should have never done it. The three Roe versus Wade decision, the opinion should never have been. Yeah, that's why it's good. Not into a law, it's only an opinion. Yeah. Only our Congress can make laws that the president has to sign yeah. it. But it's an illegal law that they Yeah, it's the, uh, what do they call that? The, uh, it's unconstitutional. Well, it is unconstitutional, yeah. that's the right word, yeah. But it's when the Supreme, when the justices have more power they than they should. It's an opinion when somebody challenges a law, but otherwise they don't get involved in the lawmaking process. Yeah, that's why it was right for that to be overturned, definitely. And the Bible establishes, here, here's something, what does the Bible say about the church? It, it establishes the church as the pillar and ground of the truth, and that's in 1 Timothy 3.15. And this is why it's important to be faithful to church and uh, find a good Bible preacher church, obviously. Yeah. It's very important. This is one of the reasons. But if I tarry long, we, we just went through 1 Timothy chapter 1, the end of chapter 1 this morning. But this is, this comes up later in 1 Timothy. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. And then it goes on to describe the church as the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And I've had people in recent weeks ask me, you know, would you let certain people come to church if they're doing this and doing that? I say, absolutely. Because where else are they going to get it right? right? You know what I mean? The pillar and ground of the truth is the church. Yes. They might not be able to serve in a certain capacity or you know, teach a Sunday school class, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to stop anybody from coming through those doors to hear the word of God, certainly. Because this is where you're going to hear the truth. You're not going to hear the truth in the world, right? That's why it's important. This is important to be part of a great Bible teaching church, Bible preaching and teaching. That's what it's all about. Matthew 5, 13 through 14 says... Us about, talks about us being salt. Believers are called to be salt and light in the world. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt hath lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. We need to be salt, or, or else literally we're good for nothing. What did, what did, the, what did we talk about in 1 Timothy 1 this morning? We talk about how if you, if you don't hold faith, and you don't hold on to faith, and you don't have a good conscience, your life will become a shipwreck. It's, it's good for nothing if you're not salt. We need to be salt. And it says, you are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. We have the light of, of the glorious light given to us by the Lord. We need to share the light of the gospel. And we, need to, we, we are the light of the world. The Bible says, ye are the light of the world. This is Jesus speaking. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. He wants us to be light. Right? We sing the song in children's church, you know, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, we, sing, we used to sing it before Sunday school sometimes, even in here. But you're the light of the world. That's important to understand, right? Those two things are very important. Getting, your, getting involved in a, in a Bible preaching church and being active and, and, and also being salt and light. Being salt and light. So letter A, we're going to talk about three as we close tonight. We might, we might actually get through because I did skip a lot of the bigger illustrations here, but... We're going to talk about three things, three different ways that we can respond as Christians. If we are going to be light and salt in the world, if we are going to be uh, great, productive members in, in the church, right? Um, 
hey, we need to respond in certain ways, and obviously biblically respond with the Bible is very important. We need to know what the scripture says about the sanctity of life. But letter A is responding with clarity, being clear. That, that goes along perfectly with our series. It's avoiding confusion. If we don't respond with clarity, we're going to confuse people, right? We've got to be clear on what the Bible says. It's very important. Very important. In fact, um, one of the tactics that Satan uses is to add confusion where there should be clarity. Um, he's the author of confusion, right? That's the Satan certainly is. He used this ploy when he appeared to Eve in the garden and questioned what God had really said. Remember, he says, did God really say that, right? Did God, will thou, it says, thou shalt not surely die, right? right? He tried to question what God said and they caused Eve to be confused. Even though Eve knew exactly what God had said, Satan brought confusion to her mind. People still uh, play with semantics today, different wordings of semantics, I mean, semantics. People play with different wordings. I think the, the world, and this is, Satan's the author of this, but the world always tries to confuse us. And, uh, we're going to go back to quoting that article from earlier, that Salon article. The, the author, Mary Elizabeth Williams, she said this. She noted that in the midst of this unique moment, she talked about Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood has taken the bold step of reforming the vernacular, moving away from the easy and, and easily divisive words, life and choice. Instead, as a new promotional film acknowledges, it's not a black and white issue. So they, they tried to move away from using pro-life or pro-choice and, and make it more confusing, more of a gray area. And then certainly we see that people are confused today about this issue. Sometimes uh, abortion advocates frame their arguments to suggest that the actual state of the unborn child is, is a gray area. But as we saw earlier, we saw this uh, last week and a little bit tonight already, it's very clear that Scripture places personhood on the baby, calls baby people, and calls them babes and not just clumps of cells. And that's the world likes to say. It's, it's sick and sad. Personhood of the unborn is absolutely clear in Scripture. Some suggest that knowing exactly when life begins in the womb is a gray area. So some we know it begins at con conception. But there's, there's three other areas that people try to say, oh, life begins at this point. One of them is called viability. And, and that's the point at which the baby is potentially able to live outside the mother's womb. But then the book goes on to give arguments against that. But what about those who have been seriously injured and required machines to keep them alive while their bodies heal? So, and then there's something called cog cognizance. Cognizance. The point at which the baby is aware of its surroundings. But what about those in a coma or in a physical state in which they are not cog cog cognizant? Excuse me, cognizant. And then the heartbeat. Some people believe that the baby uh, has life at, at a heartbeat. The, the moment of heartbeat is seen as the, state, as the start of life by some, but what about those who have a pacemaker whose heart will not beat without intervention? So according to the Bible, the clearest demarcation of life's beginning is conception. If we were to respond to this issue with clarity, we, we should stand for life at conception. In fact, in fact, this is a point in which Scripture and scientific evidence, and human conscience, and the abortion industry itself all agree on. They do, but they pretend that they don't. Scripture agrees on this. What Noah says, we have already looked at many verses that recognize life in the womb. We're going to look at Psalm 51. I don't have it on the screen. I'm going to read it, though. Psalm 51, 5. What does it say? This is important. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Yeah, I, I can say that too. We all can say that, right? Because we're all sinners. We've all been conceived in sin, but we didn't. We weren't conceived. And we were shaken in iniquity. But praise God. Psalm 51 goes on to talk about being cleansed, right? Cleanse me, O Lord. Oh, it's a wonderful psalm. I love Psalm 51. Behold, I was shaken in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. But the Lord cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Scientific evidence even agrees. We're going to show some things on the screen. I hope everyone in the back can read it. If not, I'm going to read it. But we're going to go through just a few things. I think there's eight things, eight things listed here, just going through certain weeks and months and, and uh, what happens to the baby during this specific time. You can certainly see 
looking at all this, there's evidence that the baby in the womb is a human being. And I hope that nobody disagrees with that in here, but we'll talk after we'll talk afterwards if that's the case. But on the very day of conception, all 46 chromosomes are present. So say somebody conceives a baby on January 1st. And that's, it's going to go through some dates here. On the very day of conception, all 46 chromosomes are present. So a human life has already begun. This is a unique human being with a unique genetic makeup who can never be reproduced or, or replaced. It's a, at the day of conception. Then we come to January 22nd, so about three weeks later. Only about three weeks after conception, the child's heart begins to beat, pumping her or his own blood. So that's three weeks later. Then we come to about five weeks, so two weeks after that. In the fifth week, which is around the time many mothers confirm that they are pregnant, the child's eyes, legs, and hands begin to develop. Then we come to February 14th, which is about seven weeks. The baby starts kicking, and the child's brain waves, which have already been active for some time, are now detectable. So that's about seven weeks in. Then we see on the, on the seventh week here, for, on the seventh week from conception, the baby starts kicking and screaming. I almost said kicking and screaming. That's what babies do after the born. <laughs> uh, kicking and swimming. Just under two months into the pregnancy, every organ in the child's body is in place. The bones are taking shape. Fingerprints have already began to form at that point. Well, come on, tell me that's not a human in there, right? Here we go, mid-March, teeth begin to form, fingernails develop, the baby can turn his or her head, and she can even frown. <laughs> she can even frown, so that's interesting. We go on, the baby, in late, in late March, the, the baby can grasp objects. This is, this is about three months into the pregnancy. The baby can grasp objects, oftentimes grasping the um, umbilical cord. And then we come to four months, whoa, whoa slow down there. We come to four months and the baby can start having dreams during REM sleep, so that's interesting. Can you have dreams if you're not alive? I don't think so. There's some other things. We're going to skip some of this, like I said, but so we, we, we're talking about how scientific evidence even agrees. That's, that's scientific evidence we just saw. Scripture certainly agrees. We know that. Agrees that life begins at conception. Human conscience agrees, too, because there's a... There's, they say, and I've heard this on, I actually heard this on the radio as well. Um, I've heard a few different organizations that, that actually do this as their full time, this is what they do. They actually ask people to donate to them so that they can get ultrasounds for pregnant women so they can see the baby. And it says, research shows that 84% of mothers will decide not to have an abortion after seeing an ultrasound. 84%. And certainly, uh, there's probably a lot of doctors out there that, that probably try to uh, persuade them not to have an ultrasound because of that, I'm sure. But 84%, that's a huge percentage. As the ultrasound shows the reality of life within, many women recognize the personhood of their babies in a way they had not recognized before. So, human conscience agrees that life begins at conception. Another, the abortion industry itself does, believe it or not, they... That's a problem that I always have with people that are confused and people that take the Word of God out of context and people that, that don't even believe the Word of God. They, so many contradictions. They contradict themselves so many times. But it's a primary goal of the abortion industry to conceal the reality of their work and thus to downplay or outright deny the humanity of the babies that they kill. They outright, but I'm not going to read about it because it's a little gruesome here. But it goes on to talk about how there's some in the abortion industry that they, they keep the parts of the baby and all that stuff. You know, if it's not a human, then why, what are you, why are you concealing it and hiding it, the fact that you're doing that? If, if life, and I, I've probably already been kicked off of Facebook and YouTube for this, by the way, I'm sure. But if life begins at conception, then here's the fact, and this is biblical here. If life begins at conception, which we proved that it does, then abortion is murder. Abortion is murder, right? But if life does not begin at conception, why does the abortion industry try so hard to keep mothers from seeing an ultrasound or, or seeing their baby as human if life doesn't begin at conception? Think about that. The percentage we just, it's right on the screen still. 84% of mothers will decide not to have an abortion. And like I said, if, if you are linked to anybody or close to anybody who has one or had one, God will forgive you. Certainly. I, I want to say that again. That's what we really went over today. God forgives anything and anybody. And he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we're talking about responding with clarity. Number two, or letter B, excuse me, letter B is, let me skip a few of these. 
respond with conviction. That's important. We need to respond with conviction. We can't just say, you know, uh, I think the Bible says this, and I think that uh, I'm not sure, though. We need to know what the Bible says. That's the whole point of avoiding confusion. We need to have conviction. Not, not, not conviction, but like I said, like the book said, too, based on a political party. or Conviction based, no, conviction based on what the Word of God says. We need to know. We, it's important to know what the Word of God says about issues like this. It certainly is. Thou shalt not kill. Pretty clear. <laughs> Respond with conviction. God is not indecisive. Right? God's not indecisive. There's times where he changed his mind, right, and he showed mercy. And there's times, you know, with Abraham, Lot, that whole, uh, you know, with, with God went to, uh, Abraham went to God, excuse me, and said, will you spare Sodom for 50 righteous? And it, it's not, Abraham was, and God said, yeah, I'll spare for 10 righteous. And then they couldn't even find 10 righteous. But God would have changed his mind if they could. And God has repented of, of, of it uses the word repent, he's turned to change his mind about certain judgment in the Old Testament. We see that there's certain times where he, he had mercy and changed his mind. But he's not indecisive. That doesn't make him, God is not indecisive when it comes to things like this. Proverbs 6, 16 and 17 says, these six things that the Lord hate, these things don't change. Things that are abomination to the Lord, God doesn't just one day say, oh yeah, you know what? I know what the Bible says it's an abomination, but you know, now that we're in the year we're in the year 2022, so it's no longer an abomination to me. So God doesn't change his mind, right? I am the Lord, I change not, the Bible says, right? A proud look. These are some of the things here. We're not gonna quote the whole section, but the one we're gonna look at here, especially that last one right there on the screen. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands and shed is in blood. It's an abomination to the Lord, but the Lord will forgive you. So remember that. He has mercy on us. We need to speak the truth in love, but also with conviction and clarity as well. Important. Conviction and clarity. Because God is not indecisive. God does not change. And, and we shouldn't change either based upon the world and, and what direction the wind is blowing. There, there are Christians out there that, that live that way. And they'll, they'll believe whatever the world tells them to believe. And they won't look at the scripture and see what the scripture says. That's why we mentioned the verse earlier about the, the church being the pillar of, of truth. And the place, that's where you're going to come to learn the truth if you go to a good church. So there's so many more things we can say here, but I'll just quote what the book says on this one. Abortion is the exact opposite of the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus said, I will lay down my life for you. That's what the gospel says. Jesus said, I will lay down my life for you. Abortion involves a mother saying to her unborn child, Abortion involves a mother saying to her unborn, born, unborn, why can't I say that word? Unborn child. The mother says, you will lay down your life for me. So see how that's the opposite of the gospel? Sometimes there are Christians who believe in the sanctity of life and they fail to express those truths with conviction. Instead, they play a game of trying to figure out how to respond to the tough question without sounding judgmental. And I'm not going to lie, I'm not saying I was reluctant to teach this, but when I was looking through, there's certain, no, it's funny, I'm definitely not, obviously, because I've, I've said a lot of things that uh that the world disagrees with tonight. I'm not, I, I never hold back when the Word of God says something. I, I'll even uh, lose my job over it. I, I'm just going to preach the Word of God and, and not care. But um, when I was looking through this, when I was looking through when I first ordered the book, I was looking at a few chapters. I'm like, uh, <laughs> you know, I wonder how uh, people are going to respond to that one. And there's some other ones coming up as well. There's, you know, all the, I said in the beginning, remember I said that all the topics, all the controversial, I keep saying that word, but not to us. We're just going to look at what the Bible says. Though. That's all we can do, and that's important. Even though we can, so, and, and, and I, I understand, I do sort of understand how some Christians can get scared about, oh, what's my family going to think if I take the stance on the Word of God? And certainly, there, there's that. That happens, right? There, there are divisions. Of, these kind of topics do cause divisions in families, certainly. But the Bible's very clear. We need to take a stand on what the Bible says. Not that we need to neglect our families, but if it comes down to our family and, and, and what the Bible says, the Word of God says, we need, to, we need to side with the Word of God. Especially friends, too, and co-workers. And not, you know, we need to respond in love, respond with clarity, respond with conviction, as we're talking about. But we, need to, we definitely need to stand on the Word of God. There's no other clarity. Clarity and conviction comes from the Word of God. If we, know the, if we hide God's Word in our heart, right? We'll have the clarity and conviction that we need to, to deal with these issues. So we'll go ahead and um, 
me see here. The last one, we'll get the last point. We're going to skip a lot of the verses on the screen, Dad, but letter C, we're going to get, we'll read through the verses really quick and then we'll just give letter C. Here's one, this is important. And this is what clarity is all about, a conviction. To, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Right? If you know that the Bible says, thou shalt not kill, right? and you know that the Bible talks about that, and you don't speak up, and, and you, you take a stance opposite of what the Word of God says, and you know to do good and do it not, to you it is sin. Uh, Genesis 4.10 says, and he said, what hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. That's God speaking to Cain there. What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. Proverbs 31 8, open thy mouth for the dumb and the, and the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Psalm 94 16, who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Right? This is, we need to have conviction. Who will rise up for me against the evildoers? Or who will stand up for me against the workers of iniquity? If we know the word of God and we believe that the word of God is true, every word in the Bible is true, we need to stand up against the evildoers and the workers of iniquity. Not let them sway us away from them. But, and I say but, but really end, respond with compassion. We need to have compassion. Certainly, very important. I'm going to end with this. The book actually gives a few different ways to respond with compassion. I'm not going to give them all, because that's where they kind of do get into a little political talk. Um, it says you can vote. Voting certainly does it is a way that we can change things, obviously. That is not wrong to do so, obviously. We need to vote on candidates who line up with biblical standards. I'm not getting up and being political. I, I've often said I don't want to I would never get up and tell people who to vote for, but I will say this pick the pick the man or woman that, that lines up with what the Bible says. Simple. But there's some other things we will focus on just as we close. In fact, just two things. We can pray. We can pray. That's one way we can respond with compassion. We can pray. Think about that. That's really the answer for many things. Everything. We need to pray about everything. And everything give thanks. For this is the will of God. And the same pastor says pray without ceasing. We need to pray for the mothers who are struggling with those choices. Think about that. There, there's many, even, even some Christians that make, my, my biological mother was, was raised in a church. And she was saved. And she made a, I'm using that term, made a mistake. But you know, you know where I stand on that. It wasn't a mistake at all in God's book. But she made what the world would call a mistake, and she had a choice. She made the right choice, but even some Christians are, are faced with the, that choice. Right? Ooh, think about it. We need to pray for those in that position. Not condemn them. Not get up and say, you wicked sinner, I can't believe you did that. No, pray for them. Show compassion. Pray for, for churches and Christian counselors who interact with mothers that are making those choices. There, there are some churches that are equipped with that kind of ministry where some of the larger churches where there's counselors there that, that, have, to, that have to counsel young ladies who have, to have, who have a choice to make. And they have to, they have to speak the love with clarity and with conviction and with compassion. It's important. We need to pray for those, not just the counselors, but also the, the ladies being counseled about that. Pray for the lawmakers to understand what is at stake as they consider legislation that protects innocent lives. So we can pray. We can pray. That's one way to show compassion. I'm not going to get into it, but one of the things they say is you can adopt. I know the Lord doesn't call everyone to that, and He doesn't equip everyone financially for that either, but it says here, if you are called to adopt, it actually says the Lord will provide. My parents are a perfect example of that. I used to think I was rich growing up, but apparently I cost them a lot of money. Because they, they said that my dad tricked us, or my mom, if my mom mostly, she tricked us into thinking we were rich. But I was just the son of a mechanic. He wasn't making that much at the time. and um, We always had food on the table. Sometimes it was ramen noodles and, and like grilled cheese, you know, all that stuff. I never thought we were poor, and apparently I cost my parents at least $40,000 extra for, for adopting me. Right? It says adoptions typically cost between $8,000 and $40,000. But the average abortion is only about five hundred. dollars they say. So you see how the world, they, they want adoption to be so, they, they don't want it to be an option. Praise the Lord, we have, we have families in here, I love it, that have adopted some, some children that needed new families. And that's, I needed a new family. God put me in a great family. 
yeah, like I, I always say, me and my dad had issues growing up, but I, I don't regret one second of it. I'm glad I grew up where I was. I heard the gospel at a young age. The Lord knows that. We can adopt if, if the Lord calls you to that. Like I said, he doesn't call everyone to do so. Had and I have considered it, and, and if, if, ever, if ever there's a need and we're the only ones available we're going to, I think I would know how to handle an adopted kid pretty well, just because I know there's a different mindset. Adopted kids think a different way. But think about it. Adoption is much better. I'm saying this as an adopted child myself. Adoption is, is, is the option, right? I understand that some mothers cannot take care of the children. and Adoption's a great option. God talks about adoption, he, how we're adopted into his family. In the book of Galatians 4 talks about that. And, and uh, the book of one of the Corinthians, one of the two, I forget which one. I think it's 2 Corinthians, talks about that as well. I know Galatians 4 does. I preach from there many times. Talks about how we're adopted into the family of God. He uses the illustration of adoption, taking us from the darkness and, and the wickedness of, of being the children of Satan and putting us into God's family. Amen. And so, so that's a great thing you can do, right? You can adopt. You can you can pray for them. You can adopt if you're able to. There's a great need for Christians who will provide loving care to children. Look, look. I guess I'll go there. <laughs> Why not? We'll, we'll we'll close in a moment, but. There's some not good families adopting children out there. Mm -hmm. We as Christians need to adopt kids and, and rise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord and, and, and give them the gospel at an early age and raise them in church, right? Nothing wrong with me saying that, right? We need, we need to, there's a great need for Christian families to adopt. A great need there. If the Lord leads you into this ministry, let me say, he'll, he'll enable you. He'll, we talk about the enablement of the Lord. If that's the ministry he calls you to, which it is, it's a full-time, that's my mom. It's a full-time ministry, God, I'll tell you that. If the Lord leads you into this ministry, he will enable you to do it. And uh, that's pretty interesting. My parents were able to uh, pay, they, they have a house that's all paid off now, so it's not like I put them into too much debt. They, they eventually got out of it, but they're doing, they're doing fine right now, but... Um, hey, there's other things we can do as well, but praying and adoption are a great option. Responding with compassion. Responding with compassion. So we'll close there, and uh, we'll pick up in the next lesson next week, on lesson number seven, which is, um, lesson number, number seven is, was that? Yes, respond with compassion. I believe. Let me get a, is there any A or B on there? Oh yeah, conclusion. There's no, uh, there's no points in the conclusion. Uh, they, in the conclusion, they just, um, I didn't read the conclusion, but they were just talking about how um, it, it actually led into a salvation testimony thing. It talked about how Jesus humbled himself. He took on Jesus took on humanity. And he was put in Mary's womb. And literally, uh, he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Right. That's what it talks about in the conclusion. And, and he also, he, he showed his amazing mercy. He, he offered himself as a sacrifice that we might have eternal life. So that's what the conclusion is. It went into that. How Jesus himself, I mean, think about it. I mean, God made us in his own image. And Jesus himself, God in the flesh, came and became one of us. He became, he took on human flesh and dwelt among us. That's, a, that's beautiful right there. Beautiful. So responding with compassion is the last point there. We need to pray a lot for, we need to pray. Even now, I'm sure, how many, many, there's so many abortions that take place as we read the statistic. There's many, many ladies out there right now considering the alternative. And we need to pray for them, pray that somebody will come their way with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and, and adoption, like I said, adoption is a great option. Adoption, hey, they're right, I didn't even realize. Adoption is a great option. Let's pray and then we'll be dismissed. Next week, I wanted to mention what we're going over starting next week. And that is the presence. We're just going to talk about the presence of evil in the world. The presence of evil in the world. And that's lesson seven. And then there's, there's a, I think there's only 11 or 12 chapters in this book. Maybe 13. Yes, 13. So we're, we're about halfway through now. We'll be halfway. Actually, we are halfway through now. Because uh, we're on lesson seven. So lesson seven, the presence of evil. But we need to understand what the Bible says. In all these topics that we're bringing up. We need to not be reluctant, but but at the same time, we need to, it's very, very, very clear that we need to respond in love, respond in clarity, respond with conviction, and respond with compassion. That's what the Lord does. The Lord, He's compassionate to us, is He not? We need to show that same love to others. Let's go ahead and pray, and we'll be dismissed. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I want to thank you so much.
so much for the Word of God and very clear on, on issues like this. And we ought, we're I'm so glad that the Word of God is not confusing on these issues. And, and we can avoid confusion by being very clear and having conviction about what the Bible says. And you're not you're not a god of confusion, but Satan is the author of confusion, Lord, and he wants to confuse even us Christians and get us to believe things contrary to your word. I, I pray that we would be firm in your word, that we would be continue to just read the Bible, to continue to study it, to dig deep, and to see what you, you say, and to love, just have a love for the word of God. I, I pray that for all our, our whole church, Lord, that we would all love the word of God, that we would all just realize that you sent your word to us and you revealed it to us. And it's all about you, Lord, all about Jesus Christ. And, and we thank you for that. We thank you for the fact that we are made in your image. It's humbling to think that and to know that. It's, it's very humbling, Lord, but, but we thank you for it. We thank you so much that you've breathed into us the breath of life. and You've found us to be, even though we oftentimes don't feel like it, you've found us to be worthy because of your blood. And, You've saved us, and you've called us, as we talked about this morning. You've given us a purpose. Oh, Lord, I'm so humbled by that. And you've also enabled us. So let us use the enabling from the Holy Spirit to help somebody, to pray for those that we just said. We talked about prayers, or whatever you would lead us to do, Lord, in this area. Pray that you would give us opportunities to, at the very least, which is the very most, actually, we can do is pray. We can pray. And I pray, we, I pray that we do pray for every situation, Lord, that we're, we're always coming to you for the answers and not anyone in the world or anyone else, but the word of God and, and prayer, Lord, and so important. Thank you for those who are here tonight. Thank you for the wonderful time of fellowship we had all day today and the, the meal we had tonight. I thank you for providing that for us. And it's just wonderful just to, to be around our church family, Lord. And I pray that we would have all have safety as we go home and bring us back on Wednesday night to hear from your word once again. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good night and Baronetta. Come, Lord Jesus.